so recently I recorded a podcast with Leo Lightfoot, who we don't mention in this recording at all, but uh, unbeknownst to the audience, he is actually my cousin. He's also an amazing filmmaker that travels the world creating the most awesome footage for some of the most interesting musicians, sports brands, and so on around the world. Um, he's also much younger than me, he's a proper whippersnapper. Um, uh, I'm just going to quickly show you some of his work and then we'll dive straight into the podcast. I like that there's no guarantee I like that I can wait and see I can't control my destiny I bet on you, that'll be me What an amazing filmmaker Leo is. Um, so basically, Leo and I um, have known each other our entire lives almost. Um, um, but in uh, the recent uh, weeks of lockdown and so on, we've been going through this journey together of, of what do we do as content creators when, uh, when we can't get outside and create content. And it's particularly pertinent for Leo, uh, who has to go out and film people, go to festivals, you know, the events that he goes to. Uh, are really, really, really underpinned by people coming together and doing stuff. So in this podcast, we're going to talk to Leo, we're going to find out what he's been up to, and we're going to find out what his advice is for creatives that want to get more involved with video. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Leo Lightfoot, to the Content Club podcast. How are you doing, my friend? Very, very well. It's a lovely day, so... It is a lovely day. Lockdown. However, caveat to the audience, this is being recorded during COVID-19 lockdown. So mm, yeah. prerequisite question, how are, you, how are you handling the lockdown? Yeah, the lockdown is not too bad for someone like myself, although um, uh, I'm a filmmaker, so half of my job is currently cancelled slash postponed. But uh, the editing side is very much um, still going, which is quite nice. Um, which makes life not too bad. Um, yeah, so you've got a, a, an out-of-the-house job and an in-the-house job, and this is exactly. very much in-house job time. It's very, very much 100% in-house at the moment, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> which is good and bad. <laughs> nice. So um, so I gave a very basic introduction to you and your work um, at, at the start of the podcast, but I'd really like to hear it from you. Just talk to us about what do you do and why, why is it so awesome? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I am a filmmaker or videographer, whatever you want to call it. I essentially um, work with products or people or companies or athletes or musicians or whatever it is who want to um, have themselves filmed or mm. make adverts or showcase things in a cool way and mainly putting this on socials, so like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that kind of thing. Uh, just to show off their brand or whatever it may be so that's the day some pretty cool niches around particular like, travel and music and sports and stuff don't you mm. yeah exactly um i'd say like the main focus um is at the moment sports music travel um weddings as well and uh, like kind of corporate stuff so those are the kind of like five areas that i usually work in mm. sports is, sports has been the one that's been the longest that's like a good 10 years has been sports. yeah um, but it's predominantly now music, I'd say, is the, the biggest one. And you get to go to like all the coolest music festivals and <laughs> not and this year, chill on, chill on here. <laughs> not this year. Sorry, on, yeah. well, don't worry, it doesn't sound like you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a shame. I was like 20, I think it was like 24 I had booked in festival individual. Oh, my goodness, which I mean, would have been awesome, of, particularly the summers. Like, I've been, you know, obviously, um following your work closely but the last couple of summers you've traveled to all sorts of places around the world right i mean mm, yeah, you just missed off some of the exciting countries that you've been to in the last sort of Ooh. 24 um months. uh in terms of i say the european ones are you know everybody's been to europe so that's not as fun is it um australia uh, yeah. japan um, america um pretty much you know the whole of europe um where else jamaica uh, wow. Iceland, that was really, really cool. Iceland was a personal favourite. What were you filming um, in Iceland? That was for a travel company, um, which is kind of ideal because it's probably the best place you could ever take a drone or a camera. Um, yeah. And that was kind of this time last year, actually, April time. 
absolutely amazing just mm. drone shots there you almost don't have to have any skill whatsoever you just fly it and it looks great so the, the, um, the scene scenery does the hard work for you yeah absolutely yeah it's already been sculpted for your needs um so yeah some cool places um absolutely but um i don't know which one's the favorite probably iceland yeah yeah oh that's cool that's awesome so yeah. what do you think what what what's the 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 best thing about being a uh, a traveling filmmaker Ooh, that is a good question. I think um, I'd say the like creative, create creativity side of it. In mm -hmm. terms of every time you go somewhere, you're obviously like it's a new experience, it's a new place for you, mm -hmm. um, and so you're kind of working around where you are. So things like Iceland or Australia, or if it's a city or kind of like a landscape or whatever, it's it's very much kind of like challenging you to create something using that environment yeah. and. You know, you may have a lot of skills in shooting stuff in a particular area, but, it, you know, each place you go to, each location is yeah. you know, having to kind of sculpt that to whatever it, whatever it is. Yeah. What do you think the skills are? Like, what, what what is that skill? Like, that idea of working with the space that you've got, and how do you develop that skill, do you think? I think being able to adapt, I think, and I'd say, I'd say one thing that I love about the fact that I do, like, different areas, so, like, the sports stuff or the music stuff or the travel stuff is being able to take something from, a particular sport shoot that I did and I picked up and I thought, oh, that's a really cool kind of like technique or, you know, type of shot and be able to then take that into like a travel environment or a music environment mm. um, where it not, hasn't necessarily been seen before by that audience. And so it feels yeah. like something new, whereas it may not be new for you, but it's new for that audience or, you know, mm. wherever that platform is. But I see that as a, as a pattern across a lot of content makers um, mm. and you know and and content makers in the in the sort of professional sense but also content makers in the sense of people that have to make content just because they have to as a part of their of running their own business or whatever is yeah. they very quickly get bored of the thing that they have to share or they have to say or the thing that they can create but yeah but they but, but, but people often quickly forget that their audiences may not have seen that before or seen it framed exactly in that way or yeah, exactly yeah exactly it's, it's like a it's almost it's a blessing and a curse in a way to have a certain style or a certain technique because um, each client that you work with, it's new for them and it's new for their audiences. But, yeah, and uh, they may have hired you because they want... To yeah, they want that, that technique, technique, but some, like, sometimes... But, oh, yeah. well, yeah, I kind of overused that. <laughs> but, yeah, but not <laughs> because, opera. Yeah. Yeah, I've used that swish transition about 200 times in the last month. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Well, if Star Wars can do it, uh, we can yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, oh dear so i mean like you, you talked about like having been filming sports for um nearly 10 years sorry my daughter Amy is screaming in the background um uh, get her involved i'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> that she's she's fine <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um but you said that you'd started filming sports like 10 years ago tell us the story of how you started um yeah i mean um so i'm, I'm 24 now so that puts it into kind of context um i started off by you know just literally picking up a camera uh when i was kind of year 10 so what's that maybe like 15 14 15 um and doing lots of stuff on youtube that was like where mm. i first started uh doing lots of kind of like freestyle football or skateboarding or um bmxing or whatever um and then filming like things like rugby matches football matches mm. making highlights like all of this stuff which is so kind of just like I guess straightforward and it, but it's like the best place to learn because no one's paying you. No one, yeah. no one is telling you. What you were know, you studying at like university? This. At uni, I studied history and American studies. So it's yeah. like basically American history. So what was, the, um, what was the tipping point? Was there like a specific piece of content that you made that did really well? Or was there like a person that you worked with? That's a good question. That made you sort of, do you know yeah. what? I'm not too fussed about this whole university degree thing. And yeah. American, American <laughs> yeah. history can probably take a backseat for a while. Yeah. I'm going yeah. to make sick yeah. videos. Yeah, this revolution is not, not quite as fun as it used to be. Yeah. Um, uh, good question. I think it's a bit of a weird one, actually, because when I... So I, I joined uni, what, 2014, and I'd just gone to Australia that summer in between A-levels and starting uni mm. and spent like three months out there filming all down the East Coast. And that was like a real like cool thing because I was with my brother, Max, and mm. like we spent the whole time traveling and like filming like hostels and filming like uh, Whit Sundays, boat trips and like jet boating and skydiving, all these cool stuff. Yeah, that's sick. Um, and it was really then when I was like, 
people are a either giving me like a free skydive or like paying me to come and film this thing mm. uh this is really cool like, i'd love to yeah. do this forever if possible and i remember when i got my results i was still i was on fraser island uh with my brother and he was like gutted that i got into uni because we just <laughs> basically spent like three months having like the most yeah, fun yeah, ever yeah, yeah. And um, it meant that I was like 100% going back to the UK and, and yeah. starting starting that, you know, three-year course. Um, but university so, was like a really important place for your, 100%, your, your yeah. work as well, right? 100%. I, I often, a lot of the messages I get are like talking about, you know, should I study film or should I even bother going to uni if I want to do this for the rest mm. of my life? And I think one of the best things for me was A, having this safety net. Mm. I think again it was almost like being back at school where I was filming like the rugby highlights and no one no one you know was there to say oh we want it like this or it needs to be like this mm. you could just do whatever you want learn mis make mistakes and like yeah. on the next one you do it better um so it's a bit like that with the uni stuff and and you know like the sports and doing it with clubs and whatever yeah. ultimately you're working for other students so you're all kind of in the same boat of you know what's good and what's not I don't know yeah. um so you're making a lot of stuff there um so what did you what have you learned about particularly like in terms of selling your services and selling content like what have you learned yeah. from that that is still like useful and, and that you put into practice these days yeah i mean interestingly when i when i when i first joined uni and people started you know asking would you be able to make this for our club or whatever i was like really against the idea of charging for videos so yeah. i'll be like what you know i'm doing this for free for youtube i love doing it why would i take money from you i'll, I'll, I'll do it anyway yeah. um and it was my brother again max who's a bit more kind of like sales oriented was like 100 percent charge you should be charging money and whatever and that and i think that's that was the tipping point between it coming like a business and becoming yeah. like an actual um thing that you would rely on and work and all the other kind of factors that come into business yeah um and it, you know it's like a natural transition i suppose um, how much in terms of particularly in terms of like other people because i think particularly when there's this kind of uh, expectation from, I don't know, parents or friends or whatever to, to s take certain paths and so on. Like, was there yeah. any ever, um, like, where was, like, the biggest sense of doubt coming from in terms of, like, can you do this? Like, can you, can you make a career out of it? Um, I think uh, my mum always kept me pretty grounded in terms of, you know, you're going to go and do law and you're not, you're, you're not going to be a videographer absolutely not she she always said like you know it's great it's like great hobby well done like keep yeah. creative and doing fun stuff but you you are going to do three years of uni and then you're going to do a law and that's what you're going to do so yeah. Yeah, i think it was quite nice to have have like the split between normal degree life and like whatever and yeah. then this was like my outlet outlet for like when i had free time i wanted to go and make a film because i was yeah. otherwise having to focus on you know degree stuff um and obviously over the three years that kind of the the, the percentage of what time i dedicated to which thing yeah. kind of, uh, changed changed yeah. a little bit because um, for me it's, it's an interesting point of reference because you know i never went to university and and sort of started working quite early but yeah not my own business until i was 26 27 so still yeah. you know older than, than you are now and kind of like and actually you know, and that was what, four years ago. So I start, to, you know, and I'm in that place now where I'm looking back at the first sort of three years of business and thinking, well, yeah. that was my time. That was, that was me back in, that was my. Yeah. Like the safety. Kind of like, yeah. Well, yeah. It's sort of, it's uh, everything that I learned in that period of time is now becoming like the, uh, the valuable lessons to apply to whatever projects. Exactly. And stuff I'm doing exactly. now. So yeah, it's, yeah. and I'm going through this thought process myself of kind of like, what what counts as learning what counts as working what yeah. counts as earning yeah, what counts exactly. as spending yeah. you know, that sort of thing um exactly so, yeah. so that that all sounds very nice and lovely and exciting let's talk about the the mm. shit bits um and yeah. and the, all the bits that have gone wrong along yeah. the way because this is important yeah of course the, the ugly side yeah. of congress of congress <laughs> So, <laughs> would you, what would you let's start with kind of like let's tell some stories like what's some of the mm. what's some of the most difficult challenging things that have happened um i've definitely had a few i wouldn't say monumental you know cock ups but i've definitely had a few times where i've it could have gone better <laughs> um like a, for example 
there was a few, well, a few times. I think it's main, mainly based around equipment. I think yeah. I like to take the blame off myself and down to my tools. <laughs> um, but uh, like, sure, it's an expression for that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> if only. Um, like, I remember there's one artist who I work with now who is probably one of my like main kind of artists that I work with in terms of like yeah. you know, festivals and like uh, in terms of like how big they are mm. um and the first shoot that i did with them i was uh shooting this kind of like day festival thing for two other artists on the stage and i saw that they were headlining that stage i thought i have like this is my you know chance to try and get in there um, and i messaged the uh the the manager and spoke to them and they're like yeah 100 percent. like that sounds great and told them what i do show them what i do like whatever um, so booked it all in, and then um, was filming the other artists. Came out, met the met the met the artist, and said hello, whatever. So his his set then starts, and he's the headliner. So it's all kind of guns blazing with like all of the like production, whatever. And because um, I've already glitter been cannons there, like, that are firing on full everything, blast. everything like the the whole crowd. This is who they've yeah. been like mainly looking forward to, whatever. And. Um, I, because I'd been filming all day, I had, it was my old microphone. It was like the Rode one and I've since replaced it because of this. Um, but it was like one of the ones you have to have the, the batteries you actually put in. And um, just before this, this um, bigger artist goes on the stage, uh, I got the red light on the, on the mic saying, you know, about to run out of battery. I'm like, okay, bollocks. Um, that's not good. I haven't timed this well. And um I had another one in my bag. So I was like, okay, sweet. Sort it now. But because it was my first time filming this guy, I was like so nervous. I was like really shaking. And I went over to my camera bag, like pulled open the, the other battery, like started putting it in. And it just like wouldn't go in. And it was like, because it was quite dark backstage, like all the lights were out onto the crowd. I couldn't really see what I was doing. And I was like shaking. And this went off like, five minutes i was like shaking more and more because i couldn't get it in and, and like his set was about to start and it just got worse and, worse and i started getting like sweaty and i just like it couldn't work and i needed the audio because we like part of the agreement was like, i do like a recap video yeah but also the main thing that artists want now are like live clips of like the opener of the set and the final one and like all their big songs whatever and so this was so crucial and i was just like getting more and more like <laughs> agitated and um another videographer was next to me and i was like dude like please can you help me like i don't know what's going on and he took it off me and like sh like managed to like because he was like chilled and it's like managed to get it in and like fix the battery in and whatever so i filmed the whole set and the, you know the rest of it went fine got back and um went through all the all the like files and yeah. like randomly in like parts of his songs there'll be like a massive like <laughs> of the audio and stuff like this and i was like what's happened here like how have i managed this like i put the new battery in yeah and what what it turned out was because it was so dark what i didn't realize is that the new battery that i put in still had the um plastic film <laughs> oh, right. no. so the reason why i wasn't going in because it still had this film over the top i was trying to jam it in so he had like broken the plastic on the film or something. yeah he kind of broken it in oh. and um so it was like it fit, but like the audio wasn't clean because it wasn't properly connected. To the yeah, I just, it really caught that up. So that wasn't good. Um, I've had a few moments like that. I it reminds me, we I because uh, <laughs> uh, you know I, I work on um, uh, a TEDx event, and we had it this year. We had I've come up with a new uh, no no dangly earrings rule for speakers because <laughs> right yeah yeah, <laughs> you said yeah. That. I don't know how I managed <laughs> to get through all the years of this event and only found out now, but but we have. You know, we have these sort of like what I call Britney Spears microphones that sort of come around like that, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, which are perfect for stuff like this. But there was this one one speaker who had these like really long jangly earrings on, and it, every time she moved her head, like it would just bang against the microphone. Oh, and, like the recording is so bad. You know, we had to pay, <laughs> had to pay quite a lot of money to have the audio like have mixed, it properly, remixed yeah. and remixed again. <laughs> yeah, and you say, yeah. oh god, like how can we make mistakes like this this far into this professional? So that's the thing you you would. You wouldn't instantly think that if you saw some with earrings in. Uh, I think, oh, what, what a lovely uh, thing to wear yeah. for uh, great. your great. debut That's, next you know. talk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't think of that until you experienced it. And yeah. Honestly, so most importantly, what did that teach you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it taught me a lot about um, a panicking and yeah. uh, the um, sort your kit in advance. I think, mm. I think that's uh, one of the biggest things there. 
um, yeah, I think just checklist, checklist, and all, all checklist. of my yeah. checklist. Yeah, and like the, I think the worst one I've had is is where um, my Sony camera, the actual monitor, stopped working halfway through a festival as well, and I had to shoot the whole thing through through the uh, viewfinder like this, which was so hard for the entire entire festival set. Um, stuff like that it's just like you mm. learn from it i suppose so yeah, that's the kind of like that's cool. the sort of creative technology production side of things is there anything in terms mm. of actually just being a a entrepreneur business owner whatever word do you want to use to describe yourself um, in that sense? is there anything that you've learned in that respect i think uh time management is the biggest one mm. i think it's very easy if it's your own business um mm. and it's literally like you know you're dealing with the clients you're going out and doing whatever it is you do and reaping the rewards and whatever it's very easy to um really like get stuck into that and kind of forget things like friends and family and mm. um doing normal things and having normal weekends and allocating time to just chill out and do stuff that isn't the business and i think yeah. that's over the last like five years that's been the, like a huge learning curve for me Is there any really period like, of time in particular where you look back and felt like you did way too much work or anything like i think that? i think last year i think last year was by the end of the year i really learned a lot about that kind of thing like time management um like making time to see your mates like because like, especially with like the music festival stuff and like events it's almost every weekend because yeah it, you know by theory it's it's the events happen when everybody else is free and so that's when i'd be working and so you know you start missing like like holidays and uh weddings and like mm. mates uh like just even going to the pub and you know yeah i mean it's very like easy that. for like particularly like someone looking in from a distance you know like me for example that like looks at all the work that you're doing and just thinking yeah. oh, you know leo's living it up having a wicked time yeah great having hanging a great out time, on boats yeah. you know drinking <laughs> parties camera in one yeah. hand mojito in the other, <laughs> yeah, you know. but yeah like, course, i don't know yeah. but what's what's i mean what's what's that re what's that experience really like you know what is what is the I'm, yeah i mean it's it's, it's it's a bit like um it's a bit like the kind of like whole instant Instagram mm. like ethos of like showing the highlights and everybody sees that you're on a boat or yeah. everybody sees that you're with this person or this yeah. celebrity or whatever and it's like wow that's so amazing but actually um there's a lot of a kind of time where you're not doing that and time editing that kind of stuff yeah. and time where you're doing that instead of you know just going to public mates which is uh, you know you've got to weigh up the balance between why do you do all these with things in your work? Mm, because yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, you want to spend your time and money with doing with other the things. people you love in the places that you love, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's a, I know it's a bit of a kind of like deep and down one, but it's, um, no, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's vital. Big, it's, it's vital yeah. because, you know, I, I've, I'm experiencing this now for two reasons. One, because, recently becoming a dad and then being, which is quite a big one that's yeah which is, <laughs> it does it completely shifts everything without being yeah. totally cliche about it it totally mm. shifts everything yeah it makes you question every activity completely differently 100 percent. and then and then the second thing is um is this whole covid19 thing yeah because, absolutely because that's changing the way that we've that we're thinking about time and and, and where we are and, and so on yeah yeah so, what are the priorities and whatnot yeah, and, and just how we spend that time. And, you know, I'm for anyone that knows me or works with me, they know that I'm perfectly per perfectly capable of slacking off and having a nice time instead of working. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, of course. <laughs> um, but, but I think I'm starting we don't like to admit it. it. <laughs> no, I think I'm starting to understand the, uh, the fine-tuning of that balance now and how to, and actually for me, like talking about wasting time, like, you know, I'm very good at scratching at ideas yeah. and projects and things and spending too much time on, on probably projects and work that doesn't, doesn't really create that even doesn't even create yeah. value in terms of that feedback loop to giving you more time and money to spend with people and stuff so yeah i want to yeah, come back yeah. to that point that you were talking about in terms of like the influencer um space and kind of like this yeah. style of content because you could argue that both of our jobs are very much sort of compliant in 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 the, <laughs> in the creation of this of this message yeah. and i think what do you think needs to change or what do you think is right or wrong around this and like how do we you know, I think I think the way that you explained it in terms of like always showing the highlights and showing yeah. the is, yeah. is is totally true. And like what's yeah. and I think we're starting to see, you know, in terms of workplace, cultural or life and society and so on, people are starting to become yeah. more kind of uh, I don't know, they're talking about it more and more articulately too. 
in terms yeah. of like the impact that that can have on people's mental health in terms of yeah absolutely expectations in terms of where yeah. you should be whether yeah. success appearance and so on like what what's the change that you want to see in that space um it's a very good question i mean i think how i treat all of that stuff like facebook and instagram and whatever i treat it as very much a um separate entity to what like what i would otherwise do mm. and you know spend my time on and i use it solely for business like i i'd only ever post mm. something that i know is going to be seen by either clients or just like followers or whatever for like a anything that's in that world whereas like um everything else like i don't know like anniversaries or like friends birthdays and stuff i just keep mm. that separate because i feel like it's like a different part of your life yeah. i feel like that's maybe the way of going about it if you if you are you know really keen on using like facebook and instagram and stuff just kind of take it with a bit of a pinch of salt um and you know it's i saw a tweet and it kind of summed it up and it was like i know it's ironic because it's a tweet but it, it kind of summed it up that it was like you know for however many years we didn't necessarily have the exposure to everybody's opinions and thought process yeah. as we do now and I feel like it's quite an interesting, especially with like mental health, being exposed mm. constantly to what everybody else thinks and what everybody else wants to like voice isn't necessarily so it's just like positive. thinking in general now becomes under more scrutiny. <laughs> yeah, like especially with like Twitter, like that is literally a platform for posting what you think and what you're and then being and then being scrutinised for it. Yeah, and then being scrutinised <laughs> for it, which you which you don't you know you wouldn't otherwise if you're thinking it in your head, you're no one's there to scrutinise you. So it's like yeah you know it's, it's strange that we have platforms now that literally offer you a place to put that to the public and therefore yeah have your career you know you know evolve made made or, or broken in moments yeah because it's exactly something like that. you either said or didn't say yeah exactly yeah yeah like as you know you always see like the news reports about someone saying something six years ago on twitter and yeah, you do. You have politicians <laughs> and stuff, right? Yeah, and you it's do have to. Pretty brutal. Yeah. We do have to really ask ourselves, like, how important is that? And you know, sometimes yeah. it probably is, depending on what they said. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, I'm going to wrap up now. Almost. There's two things I want to do first. First thing, mm -hmm. I need to just grab my phone. One second. Mm -hmm. back in the room so <laughs> i've got three questions that i want to ask you and i want you to answer these questions in uh 60 seconds or less so brace mm. yourself i'm just going to set short timers um are you ready for your yes. 60 seconds i think so uh quick fire round and depending yeah. on your answers to these questions, you, you will or may or not have a job in uh, <laughs> yeah. based on, this is a, based on one of those know, tweets is going to come the internet, the internet will scrutinize <laughs> you deeply, I promise you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so first question is, why should people make video content? Go. Um, I think in the current climate, it's the best way to showcase what either you do or what you create or whatever it is. Like obviously in photos as well, I think it's included because every single outlet that we currently use is video or photo or whatever. So that content is the best way to kind of translate what you do to as many people as possible and kind of make you look great. Awesome. 30 <laughs> seconds, winner. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> uh, second question, 60 seconds or less. When should you say no to a project? Ooh, uh, I'd say if you don't really believe if you don't really feel aligned with what they're going for, that's probably a good a good reason not to go for something. Um, I'd say going back to like the time thing as well. Like if it, if it's something that you're not that bothered about being involved in, and it's instead of doing something with your mates and you haven't seen them for like four weeks, then maybe don't do it then. Um, but otherwise, I say flipping that i say try and say yes to as much stuff as possible because you don't know what you're going to learn from every shoot and Ooh. everything's slightly different so scrutinizing my question <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> cool that's that's awesome. you, yeah it's great well i think that's really nice because actually you know it isn't just about saying no to stuff is it it's yeah exactly it's, actually really what it's about is is learning when to say yes um, exactly yeah. yeah and especially when you're starting up as many opportunities as you can possibly get hold of is always an experience whether it be bad or good you learn from it so sure um and just ob observing like your body of work like youtube has been really important 
to you yeah. and yeah. and and you've got great traction on youtube over the years what what's your advice for how you build a brand on youtube or how you build a how do you build a following on youtube um i'd say um targeting what you do to a certain audience um so like having whether however niche like however kind of small that audience is as long as it's got a kind of like base of people who actually want to see that stuff mm. i'd say that's pretty key and secondly consistency is 100 percent the biggest one um because you see so many people like post like one or two and like yeah i'm gonna like get going on these blogs and then they post like three and get bored and don't do it anymore mm. but it's like you only build a following when you keep pushing and keep doing it and i think that's the hardest bit you know i'm i'm yeah. a stickler for posting two <clears throat> videos and thinking that it's a failure and then moving on to the next thing six weeks. yeah exactly you just gotta keep with it and like success doesn't come that quick so you no, right <laughs> keep posting <laughs> cool <laughs> Thanks, Leo. Uh, right, those you, those were your sixty-second uh, quick-fire questions. Um, and the last thing I want to just focus on is, like, obviously, you got started quite young. You know, you were, you know, pre-university that you started really getting into the game, um, yeah. and twenty-four years old now, and still just like absolutely blasting through your career and just having an amazing time creating great content. What would you? What advice would you give to? young people now like as young as you were when you started that want to start that are starting out in this video content field like thinking about what's different now but also just kind of what you've learned from the process too um i say trial and error is a massive factor i say like mm. going back again to what we just said about you know like every opportunity is a is a good one because you're guaranteed to either have a good experience or a bad experience and but you're going to learn something either way yeah so if you if you really mess something up you're going to know why you've messed it up and then you're not going to do it again. Equally, if you shoot something really well and it yeah. gets a really great reaction, you're going to be like, wow, that's what people are interested in. Okay, amazing. I'll do something more along that line. Um, again, consistency as well, like yeah. really like pers perseverance, like pushing and not, not to the point where you don't enjoy it, but, mm. you know, it's, it's good to like keep motivated and like keep doing stuff. And Do you think those two things are linked in the sense that like, you know, the what I just talked about with me, like if, if content doesn't take off, um, yeah. um, that you are there, that you then quickly deem that a failure and you stop. And actually it's yeah. a of consistency that, that, that you actually need. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say because like, obviously if you make videos for two years and you still have 10 subscribers, then maybe something isn't right with what you're making. Yeah. So it's like, a, it's like the balance between, you know, gearing it towards what people want to see or what works for the audience, but also like having faith in, you know, this, this is what I want to create and therefore I should keep doing something along those lines. Yeah. It's, it's like a nice, you know, you, you've got to kind of like find a balance between the two. It's yeah. Like, how, how is your relationship with failure, quote unquote, changed <clears throat> over the years? Um, it's a, it's a tough one because like you always see the stories of like, oh, this person really messed up and went bankrupt and now they're a multi-millionaire. And it's like all these stories of like, you have to really fail. But like, uh, for me, I feel, you know, it's, in a way it's quite, quite lucky. I think it's like from year 10 to through school and then through mm. um, sick form and then through uni, it's all just been very much a progressive path of like, mm. in terms of like how many shoots are you doing? How much mm. do you earn? And what kit have you got? And, like what what projects you're working on what kind of projects are you working on it's it's been a very much like a steady um, steady, steady curve of yeah, growth gen right? generally positive um growth um so i don't really feel like there's any like oh, i definitely should have done that instead of that type thing yeah I'm, I'm sure i'm sure some people do that quicker or um, yeah. slower or whatever but it's you know there's no real caveat i think to the whole thing um quite happy about them cool that sounds that sounds very, very uh, humble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, uh, Leo. Thank you so much for joining me for this for this for this uh, episode. It's been lovely having you and lovely uh, scrutinizing no, your career in content. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I know that this summer is obviously going to be a really different summer for you. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that you've got other plans uh, in the uh, exactly. brewing. So I look forward to. Exactly seeing those coming to thank you very much um, best it. of luck with everything thank you so much for joining us on this recording and i look forward to seeing you again soon